Google has announced a slate of updates to their Bard LLM. Here's everything you need to know. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in five-ish minutes or less. The last 24 hours have been huge for AI news. Obviously, Elon's XAI announcement is a big one, but that's what the main AI breakdown is going to be focused on today, so come back soon for that. Where we're going to start is actually with Google. The company announced a number of big updates for its Bard LLM, and I think in many ways, the way that I would summarize the connective tissue of all of these updates is that they're trying to add utility, functionality to the underlying powers of this tool. And you'll see as I dig into the updates specifically what I mean. First up, Bard is now available in more languages. Bard can be used in Europe now, and it can be used in over 40 languages that include Arabic, Chinese, German, Hindi, and Spanish. Brazil also comes online as a place where Bard is available. Next up, they've announced a feature where instead of just reading what Bard says about a particular topic or question, you can actually listen to it. They point out that this could be helpful if one is trying to hear the correct pronunciation of a term, if the response to the query is a type of language that is meant to be heard, such as a poem or a script, or frankly, if people just want to listen on the go rather than read. They've also announced more granular controls of Bard's responses. There's now one-click updates along three vectors. The first is simply complexity. When Bard produces a response, you can go down, click the Modify Response button, and select Simpler. Another vector for transformation under this Modify menu is making the response longer or shorter. Finally, a third way to modify the response is the tone, with Bard giving you the ability to, with a single click, make the response either more professional or more casual. From a functionality standpoint, they've introduced a feature by which people can pin and rename conversations. This is obviously valuable if there's a topic that you need to return to later after the session that you're currently in. And one that they were really excited to show off was new ways to export code to other places where developers live. Specifically today, they announced a new feature that allows developers to export Python code to Replit rather than just locking them into Google Collab. It seems likely that that sort of export code function is just going to expand from here. Bard now allows users to share the responses that they like with their friends or family or colleagues. And one of the big ones in terms of really expanding the functionality is a first step into multimodality. They've brought the capabilities of Google Lens into Bard, so now you can input a picture as part of the prompt. This goes way beyond the sort of Google image search that you might be used to, and instead allows you to, for example, post an image and ask for a caption. Or you could post a beautiful scene and ask for a poem about that scene. They don't use the word multimodal in their announcement, but that's effectively what this is, a first step in that direction. In many ways, this is the biggest substantive change, and the thing that makes this iteration of Bard most different from its competitors. Still, overall, this combination of features definitely increases the uses and functionality of Bard in ways that I think will likely lead to much more usage going forward. Next up, some news from the intersection of AI policy and AI companies. The Senate Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Intellectual Property held a hearing yesterday called Artificial Intelligence and Intellectual Property. The focus was on copyright, and they had a number of expert witnesses, including the general counsel at Universal Music Group, a professor of law at Emory University, the EVP general counsel and chief trust officer at Adobe, the head of public policy for Stability AI, and a concept illustrator and fine artist from San Francisco. One of the interesting things to come out of that was testimony from Adobe that they would support giving artists the ability to opt out of AI training on the things that they've created. Dana Rao said, We believe creators should be able to attach a do not train tag to their work. With industry and government support, we can ensure AI data callers read and respect this tag, giving creators the option to keep their data out of AI training data sets. Rao also went even farther, saying, We believe artists should be protected against this type of economic harm, and we propose Congress establish a new federal anti-impersonation right that would give artists the right to enforce against someone intentionally attempting to impersonate their style or likeness. This seems extremely challenging to me. Something like the do not train tag, I think, makes a little bit more sense. But a law that tries to define if and how AI-generated art is or isn't too close to another artist's style is an incredibly difficult, incredibly subjective thing to actually implement. It sort of assumes that every artist is a complete individual unto themselves, rather than an interesting combination and remix of all the influences they have. Obviously, it would come down to the details, but it's hard not to imagine how a law like this wouldn't just end up creating a massive honeypot for litigators trying to argue that their clients were being ripped off by AI, whether or not it was exactly true. But I still do think it's interesting and reflective of where the conversation is right now. 
Staying on the theme of AI policy for a moment, Vice President Kamala Harris yesterday held a conversation with civil rights leaders and consumer protection advocates around artificial intelligence. The discussion was supposed to be a working session designed to cover and enumerate AI risks to vulnerable populations, which could include people like seniors. And although people were pleased to see this level of attention being given to the issue, the specific way in which Vice President Harris described AI didn't exactly inspire confidence. And I think the first part of this issue that should be articulated is AI is kind of a fancy thing. It's, first of all, it's two letters. It means artificial intelligence. Uh huh. We also got announcements yesterday about new commercial AI products that are available. Shopify is launching an AI assistant for merchants, as a for example. The assistant, which they call Sidekick, will help merchants with questions around sales trends, product details, and more. Over in the world of Meta, the Financial Times is reporting that they are moving forward with plans to launch a commercial version of their Llama model. And NVIDIA has announced a $50 million investment into biotech company Recursion around AI drug discovery. Now, to get a sense of just how hot to trot the market is for AI right now, following the announcement, Recursion stock was up 80%. Shares of NVIDIA, meanwhile, went up more than 2%. All right, guys, that is going to do it for today's AI Breakdown Brief. If you're enjoying it, please subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to this, go check out the YouTube channel. You can get a link at breakdown.network. And I'll be back soon with the main AI Breakdown.